And now we start what we're here for. And I'm really happy to be allowed to introduce Anna Mascal. She will talk about something with a great title. I love it. Confessions of a Future Terrorist. Become terror... Terrorism is the one thing you can always shout out and you get everything through. And she will give us a rough guide to over-regulate free speech with anti-terrorist measures. And Anna works for Wikimedia where she's a lobbyist of human rights in the digital environment and works in Brussels. And she gives a lot of talks and I think it's the first time at Congress for her. Is that right? Second time. Second time. I haven't really researched it right because I searched for it. So I have to do this again, so this is the second time for Congress, and I'm really happy to have her here. Please welcome her with a big round of applause. Anna, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, as you have already heard, um, I uh, don't do any of the cool things that uh, Wikimedians and Wikipedians do. Uh, I am based in Brussels, and uh, the L word, uh, I, I do the lobbying uh, on behalf of our community. And uh, today uh, I am here because I wanted to, to talk to you uh, about one of the proposals of, uh, for, for laws that we are now uh, observing the development of. And I wanted to share my concerns also like active, uh, as an activist, because I'm really worried how if that law passes in its worst possible version or one of the, uh, of the bad versions, how it will affect my work. I'm also concerned how it, would, it will affect your work um, uh, and uh, basically all of our uh, expression online. And I also want to share with you that this law makes me really angry. Um, so, uh, so, so I think these are a few good reasons to be here um, and to talk to you and, and um, I hope uh, after this presentation we can have a conversation about this and I'm looking forward also to your perspective on it and, uh, and also the things you may not uh, agree with maybe. So, um, so what is this law? So uh, in September uh, 2018 the uh, European Commission came out with a proposal of a regulation on preventing the dissemination of terrorist content online. So there are a few things to unpack here um, of, of, of what it is about. First of all, when we see a, a law that is about uh, internet and what is about content and what is about the online environment and it says it will prevent something, this always brings uh, a, a very difficult and complicated perspective uh, uh, for us, the, the, the digital rights uh, activists in Brussels, because prevention online never means anything good. Um, so, so this is one thing. The other thing is the, this very troubled concept of terrorist content. I will be talking about this more. We will talk, uh, uh, I will uh, show you how the European Commission understands it and what are the problems with that understanding and whether this is something that can actually be really defined in a law. Um, so, uh, so these are the, the, uh, already the uh, red flags that uh, I, I have seen and we have seen when we, were, when, when we first got the, uh, the proposal uh, into our hands. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about the framework of it. This is probably the, um, the, the, the most uh, dry part of that. Uh, but I think uh, it's uh, important to, to, to correctly place it. First of all, uh, this is the European Union uh, legislation. So uh, we're talking about the legislation that will influence uh, 27 uh, member states, uh, maybe 28, uh, but we know about Brexit, so, so that uh, uh, is uh, uh, debatable what's going to happen there. Um, and uh, it's important to know that uh, whenever we have European legislation, in the EU, this is the, this, these are the laws that actually uh, are uh, shaping the laws of all those countries, and they come before the national laws. So, so should this uh, should this be uh, implemented in any of the form? When it's implemented in any of the form, this is what is going to happen. The next important part of information that um, uh, uh, I want to give you is that this particular regulation is a part of the framework that is called digital single market. So uh, the European Union, one of, one of the, 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 the objectives uh, when the uh, European Commission creates the law and when uh, other bodies of the European Union work on it, uh, is that there is that that the, the laws in the in the member states of um, of the European Union are actually similar, 
And uh, the digital single market means that what we want, we want to achieve something on the internet that in a way is already achieved uh, within the European Union geographically, meaning that we don't want the borders uh, on the internet between people communicating and also delivering goods and, goods and services in the European Union. And you may ask how that uh, connects with the, with the terrorist content and how that connects with, with today's topics. Uh, to be honest, I am also puzzled because I think that uh, legislation that talks about how people uh, communicate uh, online and what is considered uh, the speech that we want there and we don't want there should not be a part of a framework that is about market. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, uh, also something that, uh, that brings a concern. Also, uh, as you've seen uh, at the first slide, this uh, piece of legislation, this proposal is called a regulation. Uh, and not to go too much into details about what are the, the forms um, uh, of uh, legislation uh, in the EU, the important thing to know here is that the regulation is a law that once it is uh, adopted uh, by the EU, but once the Parliament votes on it, it starts, uh, um, it is binding directly on the, in all the member states of the European Union, which means that there is no further discussion on how this should be actually used. Of course, in each country there are different decisions being made by different bodies, but it means for us, the people that work on this and that want to influence the legislative process, that once this law is out of Brussels, there is nothing much to be done about how it's going to be, um, uh, uh, how it's going, uh, how it's going to be implemented, and this is important because for now the discussion about this, um, uh, because for us the discussion about this is the one that happens in Brussels. There are a few versions of the law, uh, and very quickly. European Commission proposes the law, European Parliament uh, looks at it, debates it, and then produces its own version of it, so amends it or makes it worse. And then the Council of the EU, which is the gathering of all the member states and representatives, representatives of the government of the member states, also creates their own version. And then, of course, when you have three versions, you also need to have a lot of conversations and a lot of negotiation how to put this together into one. And all of those bodies have their own ideas, every, uh, every one of those bodies have their own ideas on how any law uh, should look like. So this process is not only complicated, but also uh, this negotiation that is called the trilogues is actually very non-transparent. And there is no uh, or almost non, no official information about how those negotiations go, what are the versions of the document and so on. This is the part that we are now in, and I will uh, talk more about this later on. Um, today I want to talk to you about the potential consequences of the version that is the original one, which is the European uh, Commission's version, and it's because it would be very complicated and, and, and confusing, I guess, if we look at all of the proposals that are on the table, but also it's important because the European Commission has a lot of influence, for, uh, also informally, both on member states and also um, on... Um, uh, to an extent on, uh, on the whole uh, trilogue process. So, it, so whatever gains we have in other versions or whatever better solutions we have there, they are not secure yet. Uh, and uh, I'm, I promise I'm almost done with, uh, with this part. There is other relevant legislation that, uh, that we will consider. One is the e-commerce directive. And in this, the, 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 part of, the part that is very relevant is for this particular conversation is that the platforms according to this law or internet services or hosting providers um, are not by default responsible for the content that users play, place online. So it's a very important uh, premise that also protects us, protects our rights, protects our privacy, that, uh, that they, they are not, um, they cannot go after us um, or they cannot look for, for the content that could be potentially illegal, which would mean that they would have to look into everything. Uh, uh, but, of course, they have to react when somebody notifies them and they have to see whether uh, uh, the information that is placed by the users uh, should stay up or not. There is also a directive on combating terrorism, and this is the, uh, the piece of uh, legislation that is quite recent. Uh, to my best knowledge, not all uh, 
countries in the European Union, not all member states have implemented it yet. So for us, it was also very puzzling that we actually have a new law, a new proposal that is talking about the communication part uh, of uh, of what already has been mentioned in this directive, when we still don't know how it works. We still don't know because this law is physically not uh, being used at all. So, so this was for us uh, uh, also difficult to understand why the Commission does not want to wait and see uh, how, like what comes out from the, from the directive on combating ter uh, terrorism. So, um, so why would the European Commission and why the European legislation, leg, legislators would actually want such a law that, that again, is about the content that people post through different services and why um, uh, uh, this is an important uh, uh, issue if this is, uh, why this issue is actually conflated with, uh, with, the, with the market uh, questions and the harmonization uh, in the digital market. So uh, there are some serious numbers here, 94% um, and 99%, and I'm wondering if you have any idea what those numbers are about. Persons. I'm sorry? Persons. <laughs> yes, it's about people, uh, but uh, the numbers are actually presenting, so there was a survey done by Eurostat, and those numbers present the, the, the percentage of people, first number 94 present, uh, presents the percentage of people that say that they have not come across terrorist content online, right? So inversely, only 6% only of people actually say that they had uh, access to terrorist content. It's important to underline that they say it because there's no way to check what that content actually was. And of course, uh, we can, uh, uh, you know, uh, here use the analogy of uh, what uh, a certain American judge sa said about pornography. I know it when I see it. It's not a very good definition of anything really. So, so I would argue that actually 6% uh, of people being affected by something uh, is not really a big percentage and that the European Union actually has bigger problems to deal with and where they can spend money and, and energy on. For example, we are all affected by, I don't know, air pollution, and that's much more uh, people. 89% are the people in the age range uh, between uh, 15 and 24, but again, were not affected by something what they would consider terrorist content. Of course, uh, would somebody think of the children? There you go. The children and young people do not uh, uh, also experience it uh, in an overwhelming, um, uh, in, uh, overwhelmingly. So, uh, but this rationale is, is being used, 6% and 11%, as uh, one of the reasons why this regulation uh, is important, why this law is important. The other is the exposure to, the other reason is the exposure to imagery of violent crimes via social media. So, of course, we know that, uh, that uh, platforms such as uh, Facebook and YouTube contain all sorts of things that people look. We also know that because of their business models, they sometimes push uh, controversial content or violent content um, uh, into, uh, into people's, uh, uh, like the, proposal that, the proposals that they give to people to, uh, uh, to, to watch or to read. So, um, so this is, uh, actually the second part is not addressed by this, uh, by this proposal at all, but nevertheless, um, whenever we talk to the representatives of the commission, uh, why this law is there, they start waving, uh, that was my experience at one of the meetings, the person uh, start waving his phone at me and saying, well, you know, there are beheading videos online and I can show you how horrible it is, which I consider to be an emotional uh, blackmail at best, but not really a good regulatory impulse. So, uh, so I guess maybe the, the commission people uh, are, are somehow mysteriously affected by that content more than anything else. Um, I don't mean to joke uh, about those, uh, uh, those uh, videos because of course uh, it is not uh, uh, something that I would want to watch and, and uh, it, it is very violent, but I would also argue that the problem is not that the video is there, but that somebody has been beheaded. And this is where we should uh, actually direct our attention and look for the sources of that sort of behavior uh, and not only to try and clean the internet. The other uh, reason why, um, why this uh, law should be enacted uh, is uh, radicalization. 
Um, of course, uh, this, this, is a, this is a problem for certain vulnerable populations and people, and uh, we can read about it uh, a lot, and there are organizations that are dealing with uh, strategies to counteract radicalization. Again, uh, when we look at evidence, what is the, uh, what is the uh, relationship between co content that is available online and the fact that people get radicalized in different, level, uh, in different ways, uh, there, we didn't see any research, and the Commission also did not present any research that would actually point to at least a correlation between the two. So, again, asked about, so how did you come up with this idea since, uh, without really actually showing the, uh, the, the support for your claim that radicalization uh, is connected to that? Uh, uh, this, this is a quote from, from a meeting that happened. Public and journalists were there. Uh, again, the person from the commission said, uh, we had to make a guess, so we made the guess that way. Um, there is the guess being, yes, there is some sort of connection between the content and the radicalization. And then finally, when we read the impact assessment and when we look at uh, different articles that, or different explanations that the European Commission posts uh, about, um, uh, about the rationale for this law, of course, they bring uh, the terrorist attack that, uh, ha uh, that ha have been happening. Uh, and they make, uh, uh, they swiftly go from uh, naming the, uh, the different uh, violent ev events that have happened in Europe very recently or, or, or quite recently, and they swiftly make a connection between the, the fact that um, somebody took a truck and, and ran into a group of people or that uh, somebody um, uh, was uh, participating in a shooting or organizing a shooting of, uh, of, of people enjoying themselves, they swiftly go from this to the fact that uh, regulation of the content is needed, which also the fact that you put something in one sentence does not mean it makes sense, right? So, uh, so this is also not very well documented. Again, pressed about this, the representative of the European Commission said that, well, uh, we know that, and it has been prov proven uh, in the investigation, that uh, one of the people that were responsible for the Bataclan attack actually used the internet before that happened. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, no more comment needed on that one. So, well, clearly there are very good reasons, quote unquote, to, uh, to spend time, and, uh, time and, and, and citizens' money on uh, working on a new law. And uh, I always say that basically these laws are created because, not because there is a reason, but because there is a do something doctrine, right? We have a problem, we have to do something. And, uh, and this is how uh, this law, uh, I think, came to be. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, the do something doctrine in this particular case uh, also, of course, uh, uh, encompasses uh, a, a very br broad and blurry definition of that law. I will talk about this more uh, uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, it also encompasses measures. We, if we define something that we want to counteract uh, to, we have to basically say what should happen, uh, right? Um, so that uh, the problem is being solved. And there are three measures that I will also explain. One is the removal orders, uh, the other is referrals, and the third are so-called proactive measures. This is, I guess, the part where, uh, where we touch the, the prevention um, uh, most. Um, and then the third issue is that uh, the, the, the one of the, of the things I also want to talk about is the links between the content that is being removed and the actual investigations or prosecutions that may uh, occur, because, of course, it's possible that uh, there will be some content found that actually does document a crime, um, and, uh, and then what do we do about that? So, uh, going forward, um, I do think that the definition and this law is basically its main principle is to normalize the state control uh, over uh, how people communicate and what they want to say. Uh, as uh, it was said before, under the premise of terrorism, uh, we can actually pack a lot of different things because people are afraid of this. Um, and, uh, and we have also examples from other um, topics, other laws that have been debated in Brussels. One was public sector information uh, directive where 
Uh, everybody was very happy uh, discussing how much public uh, information should be released and where it should come from and how people should have access to it. And uh, part of public information is the information that is produced by uh, companies that perform public services, but they may also be private. For example, sometimes transport, public transport is provided that way. And actually, public transport providers were the ones that were saying that they cannot release the information that they have, namely uh, timetables and, and other information about um, about uh, uh, how, how the system works that could be useful for citizens, because then it may be used by terrorists. Uh, I guess that maybe prevents the potential terrorists from going from bus stop to bus stop and figuring out how the buses go, but uh, we already know that this does not work that way. So, so this is something that actually normalizes this approach, and let's first look at the definition uh, at, uh, of, the, um, of the proposal as presented by the European Commission. So they say basically, let me read, terrorist content means one or more of the following information. So A, inciting or advocating, including by glorifying the commission of terrorist offenses. I do apologize for, for the horrible, horrible level of English that they use. I don't know why. Um, uh, and that I don't apologize for them, but for the fact that they expose you to it. Uh, the commission of terrorist offenses thereby causing a danger that such acts be committed. Uh, you won't believe how many times I had to read all this to, to actually understand what all those things mean. Encouraging the contribution to terrorist offenses. So contribution could be money, could be some, uh, uh, I guess, uh, material uh, uh, resources. Um, promoting the activities of a terrorist group, in particular by encouraging the participation in or support for, to a terrorist group instructing on methods or techniques for the purpose of committing terrorist offenses. And then there is also the, uh, the definition of dissemination of terrorist content that basically means making terrorist content available to third parties on the hosting ser uh, service provider ser services. Um, as you can probably see, as the dissemination and the fact that third parties are evoked mean that this law is super broad. So it's not only about social media, because making content available to third parties may mean that I am sharing something over uh, some sort of service with my mom, and she is a third party in the understanding of this law. So we were actually super troubled to see that not only does it encompass services that make information available to the public, so the one that we all can see, like, like social media, but also that potentially it could be used against uh, services that uh, may let people communicate privately. So that is, a, uh, that is a big issue. The second thing I want to uh, direct your attention to is the, the uh, parts that, uh, that I put in italics. Um, it's how soft those, uh, those concepts are. Uh, inciting, advocating, glorifying, encouraging, promoting. This is a law that actually potentially can really influence how we talk and how we communicate, what we want to talk about, whether we agree or disagree with certain policies or certain uh, political decisions. And all those uh, things are super soft and it's very, very hard to say what, that, what is it, does it really mean. And uh, I want to give you an example uh, of, uh, of, of, a, of a same content used in three different cases to, to illustrate this. So let's imagine we have uh, a group of people that recorded a video and on, the, on, the, on those videos they say that, well, basically they call themselves terrorists to make it easier. And, uh, and they say uh, that they want to commit uh, all sorts of uh, horrible things in uh, specific places. So that constitutes like some sort of a credible threat. And they also brag that they killed someone. And, uh, and they also say that they're super happy about this and so on. And they also, of course, encourage others to join them and so on and so on. And the three cases would be, one would be that this particular group posts that videos on, um, uh, I don't know, their YouTube channel. The other case would be that there's a media outlet that reports on it and either links to this video or maybe presents snippets of it. And the third case would be, for example, that there is some sort of uh, group that is actually following 
what's happening uh, in that region and collects evidence that can then help identify the people and prosecute them for the crimes they commit, like the, 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 uh, the crime that uh, our uh, exemplary terrorists uh, admitted to committing. And uh, do you think that, according to this definition, in your opinion, do you think that there is a difference between those three types of, of presenting that content, between the terrorist group that is presenting it on their channel, between the media outlet and between the activists? There is none. Because this law has nothing, does not define in any way that uh, the so-called terrorist content uh, is something that is published with an intention of, uh, of actually advocating and glorifying. So the problem is that not only does the content that, let's say, is as we, as we may call it, manifestly illegal, so somebody kills someone and is being recorded and we know it's a crime, and perhaps we don't want to watch it, although I do think that we should also have a discussion in our society uh, what we want to see and what we want to see, what we don't want to see, uh, from the fact, from, from the perspective that the world is complicated and, and we may have the right to access all sorts of information, even that that is not so uh, pleasant and not so easy to, to digest. So this law does not make this differentiation. There is no mention of how this should be intentional to qualify to be considered so-called terrorist content, and that's a big problem. Um, so uh, as you can see, there is a fallacy in this narrative because these will be the member states and their uh, uh, so-called competent authorities that will be deciding what the terrorist content is. And, uh, and of course, Europeans have um, a, tendency, a tendency to think, we have the tendency to think of ourselves as the, the, the societies and the nations and the countries that champion the rule of law and that, um, and that um, actually uh, respect fundamental rights and, expect, and, and respect freedom of speech. Uh, but uh, we also know that this is changing rapidly and I also will show you examples of, of how that changes in this area that we're talking about right now. So, uh, so I do not have great trust in, uh, in European governments into making the correct judgment about that. So, um, so we have this category of very dubious and, and, and very uh, broad terrorist content. And then, so how it's, how it's being done. The, um, the, basically, all that power to decide what the content, like how to deal with that content, is actually outsourced to private actors. So the platforms that we are talking about becomes kind of mercenaries, because the, the, both the Commission and I guess many member states say, well, it's not possible that the judge will actually look through content that is placed online and give you know proper judiciary decisions about what should what constitute freedom of expression and what goes beyond it because it uh, it hurts other people or or uh, or is basically a, a proof of something illegal so the platforms will take those decisions this will be the hosting service providers as i mentioned and then also a lot of the reliance uh, that they will do it right is put into the wishful thinking in this proposal that says, well, basically you have to put in terms of service that you will not host terrorist content. So then, then again, there's a layer in there where the, where the platform, uh, let's say Facebook or, or, or Twitter or any, anyone else actually um, decides what uh, and how uh, they want to deal with that in detail. Um, also, one thing I didn't mention is that looking for uh, this regulation and looking at who is the platform that should basically have those terms of service, we realized at Wikimedia that actually our platforms will actually be in the scope of that. So uh, not only that may affect the way we can document and reference uh, the articles that are uh, appearing on Wikipedia on all those um, 
uh, all those uh, on the events that are described or, or the groups or, or the political situation and whatnot, but also that uh, you know our community of editors will have less and less to say if we have to put a lot of emphasis on, term, on, on terms of service. I do think that we are uh, somehow a collateral damage of this, but uh, also this doesn't uh, console me much because, of course, uh, internet is bigger than, than our projects and also we want to make sure that um, that uh, content is not being removed elsewhere. So basically, the three measures are the uh, removal orders, as I mentioned, and this is something that is fairly, fairly straightforward, and actually I'm wondering why there has to be a special law to, to bring it because, uh, uh, to being, because the removal order is basically a decision that a competent authority in the member state releases and sends it to the platform. The problem is that according to the commission, the platform should actually act on it in one hour. Uh, and then again, we ask them why one hour and not 74 minutes. And they say, well, because we actually know, I don't know how, but they say they do. Let's uh, take it at face value. We actually know that the content is um, the most you know, viral and, and spreads the fastest within, has the biggest range within, within the one hour from appearance. And then we ask them, well, but how can you know that actually the people that find the content find it exactly on the moment when it comes up? Maybe it has been around for two weeks and this one hour window when it went really viral is like long gone. And here they don't really answer, um, obviously. So, uh, so, so this, is the, uh, this is one of the measures that, that I, I guess makes the most sense out of all of that. Then we have the referrals that we call lazy remover orders, and this is, this is really something that is very puzzling for me because the referral is a situation in which this competent authority and the person working there goes through the content, or to, through the videos or posts and, and looks at it and says, well, I think, I think it's against the terms of service of this platform, but does not actually release this removal order, but writes to the platform, lets them know and say, hey, can you please check this out? I'm sorry, I'm confused. Is this the time that I have left or the time? Okay, good. Time is important here. So, so basically, uh, you know, they are basically won't spend the time to, pre to prepare this removal order and, and write uh, and take, let the platform to, to tell the platform actually to remove it, but they will just ask them to please verify whether this content should be there or not. And first of all, this is the real outsourcing uh, of, of power over, uh, over the, the, the speech and expression, but also we know how platforms take those decisions. They have a, a very short time. The people that do it are sitting somewhere most probably where the content is not originating from, so they don't understand the context, sometimes they don't understand the language, and also, you know, it's better to get rid of it just in case it really is problematic, right? So this is something that is completely, it creates this gray, gray area of, uh, of, um, uh, of information that is controversial enough to be flagged, but is not uh, illegal enough to be removed by the order. Um, the, by the way, the European Parliament actually uh, kicked this out from their version, so now the fight is uh, uh, in this negotiation between the three institutions to actually follow this recommendation and just remove it because uh, it really does not make sense and, and it really makes the, uh, the, the people that release those uh, referrals not really accountable for, for their decisions because they don't take the decision, they just make a suggestion. Um, and then we have the proactive measures which most definitely will lead to over-policing of content. There is a whole uh, very clever description uh, in the law that basically boils down to the point that if you are going to use content filtering and if you're going to prevent content from disappearing, then basically you are, uh, you are doing a good job as a platform and this is the way to actually deal with terrorist content. Um, since However we define it, again, this is very context-oriented, very context-dependent. It's really very difficult to say based on what sort of criteria and based, uh, based on what sort of databases those automated processes will be, uh, will be happening. So of course, as it happens in today's world, uh, somebody uh, privatizes the profits, but the losses are always socialized. And, um, and this is no, uh, no uh, exception from that rule. So again, when we were talking to the European Commission and asking them 
Why is this not a piece of uh, legislation that belongs to the enforcement of the law and that is then not controlled by, uh, uh, heavily by uh, the judiciary system and by any other sort of oversights that enforcement usually had? They have, well, because you know, when we have those videos of beheadings, they usually don't happen in Europe and they are really beyond our jurisdiction. So of course nobody will act on it on the very meaningful level of actually finding the people that, uh, that are killing, that are in the business of killing others and, uh, and making sure they cannot continue with this activity. So it's very clear that this uh, whole law is about cleaning the internet and not really about uh, meaningfully uh, tackling societal problems that uh, lead to, uh, uh, to that sort of violence. Um, also, the, 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 the redress, which is the, the mechanism in which the user can say, hey, this is not the right decision. I actually believe this content is not illegal at all, and it's important for me to say this, and this is my right, and I want it to be up. Those, uh, those provisions are very weak. Uh, we, you cannot actually protest uh, meaningfully uh, against the removal order of your content. Of course, you can always take state, the state to court, but we know um, how amazingly interesting that is and how fast it happens. So, uh, that, so we can, I think we can agree that there is no meaningful way to actually protest. Also, the state may ask, well, actually, this, um, this uh, removal order uh, should, uh, the, the user should not be informed that the content have been, has been taken down because of, ter of, of terrorism, so, or depicting terrorism or glorifying or whatever. So even, you may not even uh, know why the content is taken down. It will be a secret. Uh, for referrals and for uh, proactive measures, well, you know what, go talk to the platform and protest with them. Uh, and then, of course, the other question is, so who is the terrorist, right? Because this is a very important question that, that we should have answered if we want to, uh, if we want to uh, have a law that actually uh, is, is meaningfully engaging with those issues. And of course, well, the, the, as, as you know already from, from what I um, said, the, um, the European Commission in that particular uh, case does not provide a very good answer, but we have some other responses to that. For example, Europol um, has created a report and then uh, there was a blog post uh, based on that, uh, on the title, On the Importance of Taking Down Nonviolent Terrorist Content. So we have the European Commission that says, yes, it's about the beheadings and about the mutilations. And we have Europol that says, eh, you know, actually, this nonviolent terrorist content is super important. So basically what they say, and I quote, Poetry is a literary medium that is widely appreciated across the Arab world and is an important part of the re region's identity. Mastering it provides the poet with singular authority in Arabic culture. The most prominent jihadi leaders, including Osama bin Laden and former um, Islamic State spokesman Abu Muhammad al-Adnani, frequently included poetry in their speeches or wrote poems of their own. Their charisma was closely intertwined with their mastery of poetry. So we can see the arch that is being made by Europol between a very important aspect of a culture that is beautiful and enriching and about the fact that is that uh, that Europol wants it to see it weaponized. The other part of the blog post was about how ISIS presents interesting activities that their members, uh, their, their, their fighters have. And one of them is that they are enjoying themselves and smiling and spending time together and swimming. So what, how do we, what do we make out of that? So the videos of brown people swimming are now terrorist content. This is the, the blatant racism of, of, this, uh, of this communication really enrages me. And I think it's really a shame that, that uh, nobody called uh, Europol out on this when the blog post uh, came up. We also have laws in Europe that are different. I mean, this is not the same legislation, but that actually give the, uh, give the, uh, the taste of what may happen. One is the, the Spanish law against uh, hate speech and, um, and this is an important part. It, it didn't happen online, but it shows the approach that basically, first you have uh, legislators that say, oh, don't worry about this. We really want to go after bad guys. And then what happens is that there was a puppeteer uh, performance done by two people, uh, the witch and Don Cristobal, and the puppets were actually, uh, this is a kind of Punch and Judy performance in which uh, this is a, 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 a genre of, 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 of uh, theater, theatric performances, I'm sorry. 
that um, is uh, kind of uh, full of silly jokes and and sometimes excessive and uh, and unjustified violence and and uh, and uh, full of bad taste and this is quite serious and the 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 two characters in the the two puppets held the banner that featured uh, a made up terrorist organization and after that performance actually they were charged with first of all uh, promoting terrorism even though there is no terrorist organization like that, and then also with inciting, inciting hatred. And this is what uh, one of the puppeteers said after uh, describing this whole horrible experience. Finally, the charges were dropped, so this is good. But I think this really sums up who is the terrorist and, and how those laws are being used against people who uh, uh, actually have nothing to do uh, with um, with violence. We were charged with inciting hatred, which is a felony created in theory to protect vulnerable minorities. The minorities in this case were the church, the police, and the legal system. Then, uh, again in Spain, I don't want to single out this beautiful country, but actually, for, unfortunately, they have good examples. This is a very recent one. So, uh, Tsunami Democratic uh, in Catalonia created uh, an app to actually help people organize small action in a decentralized manner, and they placed the documentations on GitHub, and it was taken down by the order of, uh, of the Spanish court. Um, and uh, also, the, uh, uh, and this is the, the, the practical application of such laws online, also the website of uh, Tsunami Democratic was taken down uh, by the court, on, of course, both of that on charges of, uh, of uh, facilitating terrorist activities and inciting uh, to terrorism. So why is it important? Um, because of what comes next. So there will be the Digital Services Act, which will be an overhaul of this idea that I mentioned at the beginning, which is that basically platforms are not uh, responsible by default by what we put online. And, uh, and European Commission and other, uh, the European Commission and other actors in the EU are toying with the idea that maybe platforms should be somehow responsible. So of course, um, uh, and it's not only about social media, but basically anybody that any sort of um, of a service that helps people uh, place content online and then uh, the the one of the ideas we don't know what it's going to be it's not there yet it's going to happen the beginning at the beginning of the next year so quite soon but we can actually expect that the so-called good samaritan rule will be one of the solutions proposed what is this rule this rule basically means if a platform is really going the extra mile and doing a good job in removing the content that is, uh, that is either illegal or again, uh, or, again, a very difficult category, harmful. I also don't know what that exactly means. Uh, then if they behave well, then they will not be uh, held responsible. So this is basically a, a proposal that you cannot really turn down because if you run a business, you want to manage the risk of that and you don't want to be fined and you, and you don't want to pay, uh, pay money. So of course you try and over police and of course you try and you filter the content and of course you take content when it only raises a question, what sort of, uh, uh, what sort of uh, content that is, is it, uh, uh, is it neutral or is it maybe, uh, you know, making somebody offended or, uh, or uh, stirred? And of course, other attempts, we heard it uh, from Germany, which is basically that uh, there was an, uh, a proposal to actually uh, make, uh, obli uh, like make platforms obliged to uh, give passwords of users of social media the people that are under uh, investigation or prosecution. Uh, and also, of course, we see that one of the ideas that uh, supposedly is going to fix everything is that, well, if terrorists communicate through encrypted services, then maybe we should do something about encryption. And there was a petition already on Avas to actually uh, go uh, um, to actually uh, forbid encryption for those services after one of the uh, one of the terrorist attacks. So, of course, it sounds uh, uh, it's, it sounds uh, very extreme, but uh, but this is, uh, in my opinion, the next uh, the next frontier here. So, what can we do? Because this is all uh, uh, quite um, difficult. So, as I mentioned, the negotiations are still on. So there is still time to, to talk to your government. And this is very important because, of course, the governments, when they have this uh, idea, they have this proposal on the table that they will be uh, able to, to decide finally 
who is the terrorist and what is the terrorist content. Um, and also, on, on, that's on one hand. On the other hand, they know that people don't really care all that much about what happens in the EU, which is unfortunately true. Um, they are actually supporting very much the Commission's proposals. The only thing that they don't like is the fact that somebody from the police from other country can maybe uh, interfere uh, with uh, content uh, in their language because that's one of the provisions that, that also is there. So, uh, so this is what they don't like. They want to keep their, uh, uh, their, their territoriality of their enforcement laws intact. Um, but there is still time and we can still do this. And, and if you want to talk, to talk to me about what are the good ways to do it, I'm available uh, here and I would love to take that conversation up with you. The other is a very simple measure that I believe is, um, uh, is always working, uh, is one that uh, basically is about telling just one friend, even one friend, and ask them to do the same to talk to other people about this. And there are two reasons uh, to do it. One is because, of course, then we make people aware of what it happens. And the other, in this particular case, that is very important, is that um, basically people are scared of terrorism. And, and they support a lot of measures just because they hear this word. And when we explain that what that really means, and when we unpack this a little bit, we build a resilience to those arguments. And I think it's important. The other people who should know about this are activists working with vulnerable groups because of the uh, of the stigmatization uh, that uh, I already mentioned and because of the fact that we need to, uh, to document horrible things that are happening to people in other places in the, in the world and also here in Europe. And journalists and media organizations, because they will be affected uh, by this law and by the way how they can report and where they can, they can get the sources for their information. So uh, I think I went massively uh, over time from what it was planned. I hope we can still have some questions. Thank you. So uh, yeah, talk to me more about this now and then um, after uh, the talk. Thank you. Thanks for your talk. We still have time for questions. So please, if you have a question, line up at the mics. We have one, two, three, evenly distributed through the room. Um, I want to remind you really quickly that a question normally is one sentence and ends with a question mark. <laughs> Not everybody seems to know that. So we start with mic number two. Hello. Um, so I run tour uh, relays in the United States. It seems like a lot of these laws are focused on the notion of centralized platforms. Do they define what a platform is and are they going to extradite me because I'm facilitating Tor Onion service? Should I answer now? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, they do and they don't in a way that the definition, it's. Uh, it's based on basically what uh, the, the hosting provider is in, in the European law, is actually very broad. So it doesn't take into account the fact how big you are or how you run your services. The bottom line is that if you allow people to uh, put content up and share it with, again, third party, which may be the whole room here, it may be the whole world, but it may be just the people I want to share things with, then, uh, then uh, you're obliged to, uh, uh, to use the measures that are, uh, or, or to comply with the measures that are envisioned in this regulation. And there is a, there is a de debate also, uh, and in the parliament it was taken up and narrowed down actually to the communication to the public, so I guess then, as you correctly observed, it is more about about the big platforms or about the centralized services, but actually the, in the commission version, nothing makes me believe that, uh, that only them will be affected. On the contrary, also the, the messaging services maybe. Okay, um, next question, mic number three. Um, is it uh, a follow a bit the upload filters, the copyright directive, it was really similar debate, uh, especially on small companies, because um, uh, at that time the question was they tried to push upload filters for copyright content, and the question was uh, how does that fit with small companies, and they still haven't provided an answer on to that. Uh, the problem is they took the copyright directive and basically inspired themselves from the upload filters and applied it to terrorist content, and it's again the question how does that work with small uh, internet companies that have to have uh, someone on call uh, during the night and, and, and things like that. 
So even big providers, I heard they don't have the means to, to properly enforce that. So I'm like, this, this, is, this is a killer for the European internet industry. Yes. <laughs> I want to give a short reminder on one uh, sentence rule. Um, we have a question from the internet. Signal Angel, please. Yes. Um, what, uh, the question is, wouldn't decentralized social networks bypass these regulations? Uh, I'm not a lawyer, but I will give a question. Uh, I give an answer to this question that a lawyer would give. I maybe spend too much time with lawyers. That depends. Because... <laughs> And it really does, because this definition of who is obliged is so broad that a lot depends on the context, a lot depends on what is happening, uh, what is being shared and how, so it's, uh, it's very difficult to say. I just want to say that we also had this conversation about copyright and many people came to me last year at Congress. Uh, um, I wasn't given a talk, but, but uh, was, I was at a talk about the copyright directive and the filtering, and many people said, well, actually, you know, if you're not using those big services, you will not be affected, and actually when we share peer-to-peer, -peer, then this is not an issue. But actually, this, this is changing, and there is, a, there is actually a decision of the European Court of, um, of Justice, and the decisions are not like basically the law, but, but basically they are very often then followed and incorporated, and this is the, and this is the decision on the Pirate Bay, and uh, in, in, on Pirate Bay. And in this decision, the court says that, well, uh, the argument that Pirate Bay made was basically we're not hosting any content, we're just connecting people with it, and in, in short, and the, con and, um, uh, and, this, and the court said, well, actually, we don't care because you, you, uh, you organize it, you optimize it, you, like the info you optimize the information, you bring it to people, and the fact that you don't share it does not really mean anything and, uh, and you are liable for the, for the copyright infringements. So, again, this is about a different issue, but uh, this is a very relevant uh, uh, way of thinking that uh, we may expect that it will be translated into other types of content. So, again, the fact that, uh, that you don't uh, host anything, but you just connect people uh, to one another will not be, uh, uh, may not be something that, uh, that will take you off the hook. Microphone number three. Do these um, uh, proposals contain, um, or, or what sort of uh, uh, repercussions do these uh, proposals contain for filing uh, requests, uh, re um, removal requests that are later determined to be illegitimate? Uh, is this just a free pass to censor things, or uh, can are, are there repercussions? Uh, you, just to, to make sure I understand, you mean the removal orders, the ones that say remove content and that's it? Yeah, if, if somebody yeah. files a removal order that is determined later to be completely illegitimate, uh, the, are, are there repercussions? Yeah. Well, the problem starts even before that because, uh, the, again, the removal orders are being issued by competent authorities, so there's like a designated authority that can do it, not everybody can. And basically the order says, this is the content, this is the URL, this is the legal basis, take it down. So there is no way to protest it. And the platform can only not follow this order within an hour in two situations. One is that the, the force majeure, that is usually the, uh, the issue. Basically, there is some sort of external circumstance that prevents them from doing it. I don't know. A complete power outage or problem with their service that basically they cannot access and remove or block access to this content. The other is if the uh, request, the removal order, I'm sorry, con uh, contains errors that actually make it uh, impossible to do. So for example, the, there is no URL or it's broken and it doesn't lead anywhere. And these are the only two situations. In the rest, the content has to be removed, and there is no way for the user and no way for the, uh, for the um, uh, platform to actually say, well, hold on, this is not the way to do it, and therefore, after it's being implemented, to say, um, well, that, that was a bad decision. As I said, you can always go to court with, the, with your state, but uh, not many people will do it, and, uh, and th this is not really a meaningful way to address this. Next question, mic number three. Um, how, many, uh, how much time do we have to contact the parliamentarians to inform them maybe that there is a big issue with this? What's the worst case uh, timetable at the moment? 
That's a very good question, and uh, thank you for asking because uh, this because I, I forgot to mention this, that actually is quite urgent. So the Commission wanted to, like usually in those situations, the Commission wanted to close the thing um, until the end of the year, and they didn't manage because there is no, no agreement on those most pressing issues. But we expect that uh, the, 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 the best case scenario is the until March, maybe until June, it will probably uh, happen earlier. It may be uh, the next couple of months. Um, and there will be lots of meetings about about that. So this is more or less the timeline. It's There's no sort of external uh, deadline for this, right? So so this is just an estimation, and of course it may change, but, but this is what we expect. We have another question from the internet. Um, do the uh, law consider that such content is used for psychological warfare by big nations? I'm sorry, I... Uh, um, again, please. <laughs> this, um, this content, this uh, pictures or video or whatsoever, um, does this law consider that such content is used for psychological warfare? Well, I'm trying to see how that relates. I think the law is, does not go into details like that in a way, which means that um, I can go back to the definition that basically it's just about the fact that if the content appears to be positive about terrorist activities, then that's the basis of taking it down. But there's nothing else that is being actually said about, uh, uh, it's not more nuanced than that. So I, I guess the answer is no. One last question from mic number two. Are there in, any case studies published uh, on uh, successful application of alike laws in other countries? I ask because we have alike laws in Russia for 12 years and it's not that useful as far as I see. Um, not that I know of. Um, this is so, I think it's also a very difficult thing to research because um, we can only research what what we know that happened, right? In a way that um, you have to have people that actually are vocal about this and that complain about th these laws n not being, uh, you know, enforced in a proper way. So, for example, content that is taken down is uh, completely about something else, which also sometimes happens, um, and uh, and and that's uh, and that's very difficult. I think the the biggest question here is whether. There is an amount of studies documenting that something does not work that would prevent the European Union from actually having this legislative fever. And I would argue that not, because um, as I said, they don't have really good arguments or they don't really have good numbers to justify bringing this law at all, not to mention bringing the, the ridiculous measures that, uh, that they propose. Uh, so. What we, what we say sometimes in Brussels when we're very frustrated that we, sh we were hoping, you know, being there and, and, and advocating for, for human rights is that we, we hoped for, that we can contribute to evidence-based policy, but actually what's happening, it's a policy-based evidence. And, um, and this is the difficult part. So I am all for studies and I am all for presenting uh, information that uh, you know, may possibly help legislators. There are definitely some MEPs or some people there, even probably in the commission, maybe they just are not allowed to, to, to voice their opinion on this because it's a highly political uh, issue that would wish to have those studies or would wish to be able to use them and that believe uh, in that. But, um, but uh, it's just, it doesn't translate into the political uh, process. Okay, time's up. If you have any more questions, you can come up and approach Anna yes. later. And um, there is, please, thanks for, so first for me, thanks for the talk, thanks for patiently answering.